Welcome to my wetland plant identification class. My name is Abe Lloyd. I'm your instructor. And um, let's see, this is the first unit and we'll be exploring forested wetlands and scrub shrub wetlands, essentially wetlands that have woody plants in them. And for this unit, I will visit actually two sites. Um, the first is uh, a swamp that is um, kind of near Sumas Mountain, just on the side of the road. And even though the side of the road doesn't sound very glamorous, this actually is one of the best um, swamps that I've seen in Whatcom County. Um, so we'll explore a lot of the woody plants in this swamp. And then um, we're gonna go to Tenant Lake. And Tenant Lake has a number of different types of wetlands, but we'll be focusing on the scrub shrub community along the boardwalk at Tenant Lake. Um, and then, you know, for one of our other units, we're gonna be looking at fresh marshes and we'll go back to Tenant Lake to look at the marsh community. All right, so I'm actually right here on uh, South Pass Road with the, um, the swamp behind me. And uh, just briefly, you know, I covered this in the lecture, but good indicators of swamps are uh, skunk cabbage and um, lady fern in the understory. We see both of those. And often cedar and spruce in the overstory, especially in mature swamps, and we see that as well. Um, now, many swamps aren't this mature because they've been cut over or um, they're just in more disturbed areas. And it's also common to see in swamps a lot of alder, um, especially in old field swamps. And um, in riparian swamps, you might see some cottonwood um, and more cedar. Um, so I brought my boots because um, it's been rainy recently and that'll help us get in and look at plants. Um, but I'm just going to be covering a lot of the woody plants in this first unit because um, I think it's a good intro to the plant world. Uh, woody plants are often, you know, their, their distinguishing characteristics are a little bit bigger, unlike the herbaceous plants and especially the uh, graminoids, the grasses and sedges, which you really have to get close to sometimes to see their key features. Uh. All right, so the soil here is definitely saturated like a wetland should be. I like to bring a bucket with me uh, when I'm carrying around my plant books because um, if I have a bag and I want to set the bag on the ground, it'll get wet, but I can set the bucket in the water and everything stays dry. For reasons I don't quite understand, a lot of the uh, swamp vegetation is really aromatic and smells strongly. Um, and right now, I, I mean, just being here without even disturbing the plants, I could smell the skunk cabbage. Um, and there's also, so here's the skunk cabbage. Um, I think this will be a pretty easy plant for most people, one that you probably know already. So this is Lys Lysichiton americanus. Um, and uh, big, broad leaves, they look a little bit like banana leaves, and it has yellow flowers in the spring. Uh, they're pretty much done flowering now. And uh, this plant will, um, the, the flowers will actually emerge um, when the leaves are still quite young, but the leaves are just about full size. And uh, it's an important plant to many Native Americans in this region because the leaves are kind of used um, like wax paper to set things on um, or to put over the top of um, an earthen pit oven. So the, the food goes underground and the leaves go on top and then you pile dirt over the top and the leaves keep the dirt from falling on the food. Um, and it's also a really important plant to a number of wildlife like uh, bears in the early spring. They will um, come out of hibernation and they're pretty constipated and their gut isn't really working and they'll eat some skunk cabbage um, shoots, just the young leaves and shoots and that'll um, stimulate their digestive system. Okay, we're near a road, so a lot of uh, vehicles are going by, but I'll try and <laughs> cut that out if possible. <clears throat> Another kind of stinky uh, plant, resinous smelling plant, is um, right here. And this leaf, to many, looks like thimbleberry or um, a little bit like um, a maple leaf. But um, if you rub the leaf and smell your fingers or break the leaf and, and smell the crushed leaf, it has a, an odor that actually is fairly similar to the skunk cabbage odor. 
Um, although I find it pleasing. I think it smells a little bit like lemon or citrus. And this is called, uh, commonly called stink currant or ribes bracteosum. So ribes is, is the genus of all the currants and gooseberries. And generally we use the common name um, gooseberry for the ones that have spines on the stem and currant for the ones that don't have any spines on the stem. So if we look at this stem, we can see that it doesn't have any spines. And so it fits that pattern that's called stink current because it doesn't have spines and it smells kind of stinky or fragrant at least. I like it. So one feature um, besides it not having um, uh, thorns or prickles is uh, the base of the leaves have these little hairs. This is called a petiole and where the petiole attaches to the twig um, you sometimes have what's called a stipule which is a leaf shaped structure um, but these are further um, devolved or diminutive um, into just these uh, hair-like things and um, so those a couple other currents have that but um, the combination of the resinous smelling leaves the um, thornless stalk and these hairs are, are good features for this time of the year um, and it has a really long cluster of flowers and fruits that, that can be six inches long or so. Um, so that's the stink current, very common in saturated soils. It will occasionally grow um, in upland soils as well. Um, actually don't know off the top of my head, but my guess is that it's a facultative wet plant. Um, it might be just facultative. Um, <laughs> all right, the mud is wet. So uh, another plant here right beside me, very common in wet soils, um, sometimes in areas with a little more light than this, but it can tolerate uh, some dark uh, understory conditions and darkness as well. This is the salmonberry, ribes, or sorry, rubus spectabilis. And the salmonberry has, um, instead of one leaf, like the current, it has three leaflets, all right? So this is what's called a compound leaf. That's actually kind of a bad example because it looks like there's more, but how about here? So this whole thing is a leaf and each of these, this whole thing is a leaf and each of these is called a leaflet. And um, so this is the petiole. And if you have a stalk on a leaflet, it's called the petiolet. So a petiole for a leaf and a petiolet for um, a leaflet. Um, salmonberry is starting to ripen at this time of the year. Uh, so here's one that isn't ripe yet, but it's no longer flowering at least. Um, and you know, if we look around, we might find here, this one over here is even closer to ripe. When they're fully ripe, they're either uh, a golden yellow or um, kind of a red orange salmon color. And salmonberry stems are sometimes uh, smooth without any prickles, and sometimes they have prickles. Right here we can see those fine prickles. All right, we have a number of ferns in western Washington, but lady fern is the one that um, can tolerate its toes getting wet the most. Um, and lady fern, I think one way, one reason that it can tolerate this a little better is that it um, goes dormant. Some of our ferns are evergreen, like a uh, sword fern, which is evergreen. Um, and when plants are dormant, they can handle saturated uh, conditions a little better than when they're um, still trying to um, photosynthesize and, and respire when they're living. Um, but, you know, it's uh, mid-June now, and this plant has been growing for a while. Um, one thing that it does, you probably have heard of this in the past, is that as the, as the fronds are emerging, they kind of uncoil. And the coil at the top looks a little bit like a fiddlehead. So some people call these fiddlehead ferns, um, which is a, a term that I think is useful, but um, can be a little confusing because we also often hear that um, 
the fiddleheads are edible and some are much better than others. So the, the most prized fiddlehead is from the fiddlehead fern, which is a species that grows in the Northeast woodlands, um, but doesn't grow in Western Washington. Now you can eat these fiddleheads, but um, they're not as tasty as the, um, the fiddlehead fern, the, the different species altogether. Now, if you, this isn't a wild edibles class, but just uh, for your interest, if you do want to eat these, you want to get them a little earlier in the year, you want to strip off all the um, side leaves um, so that you're just eating the shoot minus the side or the um, leaflets and minus the hairs that are found along the stem. And then you want to boil them and eat them. But uh, so let's talk about some identification features for the fiddle or so <laughs> the um, lady fern, Ethereum felix femina. Um, this fern has fronds. This is called a frond instead of a leaf um, that uh, taper from being very narrow at the tip to being quite wide in the middle and then going all the way down to being narrow at the end. So overall it looks like a giant um, football or something in shape or a ellipse. Um, it's elliptical in shape. And that, that is a good distinguishing feature. Um, another good distinguishing feature is that it grows in clumps. So if we look around over, over to the right there, there are two fern or three ferns there and you can see that each of them has its own clump. I'm standing in a clump here of uh, two ferns. So at the base of these clumps, all the fern fronds are coming together. Um, some of our other species have fronds that just arise out of the ground individually. They um, arise out of the ground out of a long rhizome that stretches underground. But the rhizome of the fiddlehead, <laughs> the lady fern, Ethereum felix femina, the rhizome is just in a ball, and so all the fronds are coming out of the same place. So those are good features for the lady fern. All right, um, let's go over to the, some trees now. Okay, I'm next to two trees, and um, trees, our trees in Western Washington generally don't like growing out of um, ground that's saturated all year long. And that's true of a lot of woody plants. They just can't handle those uh, permanently saturated conditions. They don't have the adaptations that some of the herbaceous plants do for uh, moving air down into the root zone so that um, the living tissue that's under there, it also needs to uh, respire. And, and so it needs gas exchange, needs to exchange gas to do that. And um, yeah, our trees don't have the pneumatophores that some of the cypress trees down in the swamps in the southeast do. Um, so they just tend to grow kind of on the margins of the swamps or on hummocks inside the swamp. And that's the case here. Um, there's a little mound here. And, um, you know, maybe, maybe these, there used to be another tree here that um, is partially decomposed and these trees are growing on an old uh, tip up mound from a, a tree or something. Um, it's hard to say at this point. It's uh, obviously a long time ago. These are big trees. It could be 80 years or 60 years ago that they uh, germinated. Um, so two of our um, conifers that can handle uh, saturated conditions for at least part of the year are the Western Red Cedar and the Sitka Spruce. And so we'll talk about some features of them. So uh, this is the Western Red Cedar, Thuya plicata. Um, you know, I really recommend as you're watching these videos to follow along with your book or, um, or a plant list or at least a piece of paper so you, that you could write down um, some of these words and names and take notes. So features of the Thuya plicata are this bark, which um, has grooves that are very much um, vertical in nature and they have really long grooves. Sometimes they snake a little bit um, across each other. Um, another good feature are the 
the needles. They're actually scales. So they're, they're not needles, they're, they're scales and um, they're modified leaves. Uh, so in conifers, they could either be modified into a needle-like leaf um, or a scale-like leaf. And these have scale-like leaves that are kind of flattened. Um, and they have really small cones. Um, and uh, yeah, those are all good features. Um, the bark is really important as a weaving material, incidentally, and, and so are the roots um, to the Coast Salish and other people along the Northwest Coast. And uh, next to the cedar here is the, a different tree called the Sitka spruce, Picea sicensis. And um, I could identify the Sitka spruce by the bark features alone. I often do from the road or a trail, if the, especially if the branches are up high, it's hard to see them. Now the Sitka spruce bark is distinctive in that it, um, it flakes off in these almost potato chip like flakes. Um, so you can see how they're about the size of a potato chip. Uh, I guess some of these are pretty well attached. There we go. <clears throat> um, it doesn't have long grooves. They're just kind of circular uh, pattern to the bark. Um, another good feature is the cone, which um, hangs from the branch so it attaches here on the branch, and um, it doesn't have any uh, any bracts underneath the scales. They're just um, just all scales, and they tend to be between an inch and an inch and a half long. Um, so the Sitka spruce has needle-like leaves, and if you touch the needles, they are very sharp on the end, sharp enough that they'll actually hurt when you touch them. And um, if you pull off one of the needles and rub it between your fingers, it's um, it's actually square, and so it'll roll between your fingers. Whereas a lot of our other conifer needles are flat, more like two-sided rather than four-sided. So when you try and roll them, they don't roll. Um, the Sika spruce does roll because a square is, you know, kind of almost circular <laughs> and rolls. All right, so Sika spruce and western red cedar are the two most common conifers found in wetlands. Um, you know, sometimes you might see an occasional western hemlock, but usually those are growing like out of logs that are floating on top of the muck or, you know, just suspended between uh, hummocks a little bit above the ground. Now we do actually have quite a few woody shrubs that um, do fine in wet areas. And so um, I'm going to point out a lot of those now. So one of the most common shrubs, at least in this swamp, um, and commonly in many other swamps, is um, red osier dogwood, Cornus stalinifera, or on some, um, in some books you might see it uh, written as Cornus cerisiae. And um, the dogwood is in its own family, and the family always has, um, almost always has, opposite leaves. So what does that mean? Well, here this leaf is directly opposite this leaf on the twig. And how do we know that these are leaves and not, and this whole thing isn't um, a leaf? Well, um, especially later in the year, each leaf is associated with a bud. So we could kind of see two little buds um, that are forming. Those are next year's leaves. Um, so a leaf uh, is classically composed of um, a petiole, the stalk, and a blade. And all of that is uh, folded up tightly inside of the bud. So in the early spring, since it's already sprouted out of the bud, um, you're not going to see a bud. But as the year progresses, those buds will get bigger and bigger. This leaf will fall off. The um, leaf will then be kind of dormant inside the bud all winter long and then in the spring it'll burst out of that bud. So anyway we can tell that this is a leaf because it has a bud associated with it and that these leaves are opposite. Another good feature for dogwoods is the veination on the leaf. So it's often easier to see the veins on the back side of the leaf 
and we can see that these veins all arch towards the tip of the leaf. This is something called arcuate veination. And that's a good feature uh, for all dogwoods. They have arcuate veination. Um, and there's another test you can do. Uh, actually, uh, one of my early TAs taught me this test. It's called, he, he called it the dogwood test. And if you break the dogwood leaf, um, the veins inside of the, or there's a nerve inside of the leaf veins that's a little bit stretchy. And so even though it looks like the leaf is completely severed, um, those veins are still, oops, <laughs> was completely severed. The veins are still um, attached. They, because they're stretchy, they can still be attached and make it look like the leaf is um, magically floating the bottom half. All right, look at that. Dogwood magic. So that's the dogwood test. And red osier dogwood is uh, called red osier because um, the stems are reddish tinged. They can also be green. See on the back side it's green, but they frequently have this reddish tinge. And the flowers of red osier dogwood um, are born in these um, kind of dome shaped uh, clusters. Um, it's a sign and um, they have white petals. All the dogwoods have white petals. Um, this one is done flowering and is starting to produce young fruit. Um, and incidentally, when those fruit ripen, they'll be white as well. Um, and that's not the case for all species of dogwood, but the red osier dogwood has white berries and they're fairly bitter. Not poisonous, but in my opinion, not very good tasting. So the dogwoods here are pretty tall. This one is um, probably oh, 11 feet tall, um, but they're not always this tall. I think because uh, we're in a swamp where there are trees overhead, everything is really straining upwards um, to get access to light. So let's see if we can find any other shrubs. Uh, here's a shrub that can actually get a little taller than the red osier dogwood and is sometimes considered a small tree. Um, this is called uh, Oregon crab apple or Pacific crab apple, Malus fusca, F-U-S-C-A. And um, some good features for identifying the Malus fusca are um, the leaves. So it um, you know, it's called crab apple and it's actually in the same genus as the apples that we eat from the grocery store. Um, but uh, the leaves look quite a bit different from the domesticated apples. So the domesticated apple leaves don't have any lobes. They're just um, kind of elliptic um, or ovate maybe. But these leaves will often have uh, two little lobes on the sides. Um, on some occasions they'll just have one and some of them might not have any lobes. Like this one, it's torn but doesn't really have any lobes. This one doesn't have any lobes. But here's one with one lobe. Um, so it might take a little bit of scrutiny to determine whether it's a, a crab apple or a domesticated apple. Um, but look at a dozen or two dozen leaves and you should be able to find at least a couple that have lobes if it is indeed a crab apple. Now the crab apple can handle wetter conditions than the domesticated apple. Um, and the crab apple trunk usually doesn't get bigger than about six inches in diameter um, and the tree might get to be uh, 20 feet tall. Um, and it can handle a variety of um, habitats. We see it in swamps. We also see it on coastal bluffs sometimes, which is drastically different because usually coastal bluffs are very well drained. Um, but I'm teaching this plant as a swamp plant because it is found here, even though it can tolerate other, um, other environments. Now, uh, you might be wondering, oh, it's called an apple, crab apple. Um, 
is it edible? And it is actually edible. It's quite sour, but I think it's a delicious sour. And it gets a little bit sweeter after a frost. So um, it's best to harvest in like October. Um, and an elder that I worked with, he said that his favorite time to eat them was after a frost and you could just suck the fruit right off of um, the clusters. They grow more in clusters of maybe three to eight or so. Um, and you could just put the whole cluster in your mouth, slurp them right off. He called that the kunduch stage. And um, they certainly are sweeter then. Another traditional way of um, preparing them is to harvest them just as they're starting to ripen and then actually um, put them under water for several months. And that uh, leaches out the bitterness and the sourness. And then you just are left with a nice, sweet applesauce textured um, food. This is perhaps the most common tree in our uh, swamps because many of our swamps are a little younger um, and don't have conifers in them. This is um, a deciduous tree, red alder, Alnus rubra. And it's called that because um, when you scar the bark, it will immediately, or maybe after two minutes, it'll turn a red color, almost like it's bleeding. Now, um, red alder leaves are serrated, but they're not super sharply serrated. Um, and um, what else can I say about red alder? Uh, it doesn't have any catkins right now, but it's in the birch family, the Betulaceae, and all members of the Betulaceae have catkins. We actually have two different tree families that have catkins, which um, are kind of like an aggregation of uh, flowers all um, packed onto this little um, cylindrical dangly thing. So the, the birches, uh, the hazels, and alders are all in that um, Betulaceae, the birch family. Our other family that has catkins is the willow family. The bark of the red alder um, has these um, little lenticels in them when, they're, when the bark's young. And these are little breathing pores. Um, and when the bark is young, it tends to be fairly greenish. Then this is kind of intermediate age where it's starting to turn kind of a dark gray. And um, we can see these little blotches. These are actually lichen colonies that are starting to form. So as the um, tree gets older, those lichen colonies will expand and eventually dominate the whole trunk, um, giving the tree a white appearance that makes it look a lot like a birch. But um, Alder bark doesn't peel, whereas um, birch bark does peel quite a bit. So I'm going to um, just take a little sc scar of the bark here, um, just so that we can uh, see it turn red. It's going to take a little bit, so we'll pause and come back to you when it turns red. So we can see that it started to blush um, red, sort of a peach color actually right now. But if I make a fresh one next to it, we can see that um, that's still like white and green, whereas this is kind of peach and orange colored. So we got the important trees and shrubs from this site. Let's talk about uh, some herbaceous plants. Uh, beside me here is one called Pacific Water Parsley, Onanthe sarmentosa. This is in the carrot family which is a family that um, is, has a few wetland uh, members. Um, it's, the APACA is the name of the carrot family. Um, anyway, carrot family um, plants always have a umbel-shaped flower head. So sometimes they're compound umbels, sometimes they're just single umbels. Umbel means kind of umbrella-shaped, so all the flowers um, attach back uh, to one point in the same way that the uh, spokes of an umbrella all kind of connect back to one point. And this is young, so it's a little bit hard to see that, but here is a, a little teeny umbel right there and another little teeny umbel right there. And you can see there's maybe 10 umbels all together, all connecting themselves uh, back to one point, making it a compound umbel. So some features that are specific to the uh, Pacific water parsley, um, Onanthe sarmentosa. Um, 
are a bare stem. So some carrots have a hairy stem. This one is hairless, it's smooth. And then the way it branches is, I think, pretty distinctive and gives it a little bit of a sprawling appearance. Um, so it has this kind of uh, lanky um, stem and leaves that emerge alternately up the stem. Okay, so down low it has a leaf. Um, here it has another one that's on the uh, other side from this one. Up here it's back on that side, so it alternates sides as it goes up. And another distinctive thing is the flower shoots all come from the leaf axles. So again, this is a petiole and it connects to the stem here. Um, and where it meets, that's called an axle. And uh, another flowering shoot or stem emerges from that axle. So here's another one up higher. The petiole meets the stem here. And then we have this um, shoot coming out um, from the axle. Now, uh, this particular plant is kind of reaching up for the sun because it's growing in amongst the skunk cabbages. This plant can do pretty well in shadier areas where it generally um, lays flat on the ground. And when these axles are on the ground, it can root. Um, so that's called advent adventitious rooting and enables, it's like a vegetative way for the plant to um, expand rapidly rather than um, reproducing by seeds which is good in shady areas because it's hard for flowers to um, get much attention from pollinators when they're growing in shady areas. Um, so there's actually another member of the carrot family. I'm not gonna go into detail about this one um, until we see it again in a later wetland where it's more common. But um, so we could compare the leaves, we can see that many carrot family um, plants have highly uh, dissected leaves. Um, this one is, uh, you know, just has a few leaflets, whereas this one has many, many leaflets. In fact, um, we, we say that this is a pinnately compound leaf because um, pinnae in Latin means feather and the ribs of a feather all connect to a central axis. Um, and you can think of that, that as an, an analogy where we have these um, petioles or petiolate um, branches that all connect to the central petiole. And it's not only once pinnate, it's actually twice pinnate because on each of those branches it has further branches that connect to it. So um, highly pinnately compound uh, leaf on this um, Onanthe sarmentosa, whereas this other mem um, carrot relative, um, it's not quite so complex. Just once pinnate, um, these are lobes, not um, pinnae here, but yeah. <clears throat> In slightly drier parts of the swamp, um, you might find uh, here underneath the skunk cabbage in this case, um, you might find a plant called false lily of the valley, or mayanthemum um, dilatatum. And uh, you could see that this plant has formed a really beautiful ground cover here. It can extend rhizominously or um, reproduce by these little berries that are mottled kind of green with red spots earlier in the year, but um, later in the year, they'll be um, red, they turn a, a uniform red color. And uh, you could try and eat them, they're, they're not going to harm you, but they have a pretty big seed and they're not super tasty. Anyway, uh, false lily of the valley is um, distinctive in that it has this heart shape and it has all the veins extend from the base all the way to the tip. And this is something that we call parallel veination. Now they're not exactly parallel in this case, um, because they have to swoop so far out to the side, but none of the um, none of the veins branch. So the other type of veination is called branching branching veination. Now parallel veination is indicative of all the monocots. So plants are almost at the broadest level divided up into um, monocots and dicots. 
and this has to do with um, how they germinate as seeds. So um, when the first leaves come out, do they have one leaf or do they have two leaves? If they just have one leaf, they're called monocots. Anyway, all the monocots also have parallel veins and all the dicots, they have two cotyledon leaves or um, kind of almost embryonic leaves. And um, they have some other type of veination, net or branching veination. Here is a scouring rush, Equisetum hyamali, and uh, it's related to horsetails, the Equisetaceae, the horsetail family. And um, it's different than most other horsetails in that it doesn't have any side branches uh, or leaves, really. Um, it's just the central shoot, and all the photosynthetic tissue is in that central shoot. Um, they generally grow in sandy areas, and sometimes the uh, river side wetlands are a good place for them, um, but it's not an obligate wetland species. It'll grow um, in non-wetland riversides that are sandy. Um, this is the new shoot, this is the mature shoot, and um, we could just see that this hasn't developed all of its uh, photosynthetic capacity yet. It's not fully green yet. And it expands between the nodes um, rather than having all the meristem at the tip like a lot of uh, other plants. This has meristem at each node and so the nodes will grow apart from each other. Equisetum hyamali or scouring rush. It's called scouring rush because it's really um, rough a texture that might be called scabrose in uh, the botanical world and is used by Native Americans as a sandpaper actually for sanding wood. Here is red elderberry, Sambucus racemosa. Now racemos, um, or a raceme rather, is a type of flower where um, the flowers are attached to little stalks that are all connected to a main stalk. So you hear that term a lot in scientific names, and it's always indicative of that flower structure. Um, this plant has uh, opposite leaves, and they're pinnately compound leaves. So this one has two, four, six, eight, nine leaflets, which is fairly common for the red elderberry. Um, and they always have the opposite leaves. and. Um, this shrub doesn't always grow in wetlands, and a lot of the plants we've covered today aren't obligate wetland plants. So some will also grow outside of wetlands, but I'm trying to cover, uh, I'm trying to break you into learning some plants. I'm trying to give you some easier plants to start with, um, and um, including some that are often found in uh, wetlands, but not all the time. So red elderberry is in that category of, you know, often being in swamps, um, but it, does not in and of itself indicate that we're in a swamp. Um, red elderberry has a pithy stem. If you break it open, it's white on the inside and not woody, but this pith is, um, geez, the sun is probably making it hard to see, but it's really spongy. I could just squish it. So the inside of the, of the stem is filled with that pith, and um, that just enables the plant to grow really quickly because it doesn't have to produce wood, which is energetically expensive to produce. So um, you can see that this whole shoot from here all the way up to here is one, that's probably just about six feet of growth is all one season of growth in just the last two months probably maybe two and a half months. Now, um, the fruit of red elderberry and the flower, as I mentioned, grow on these racemes. So, um, so this is the central stalk and then each flower and fruit have its own individual stalk. Okay, it's noisy here. And uh, the berries will ripen to red. They're uh, green now, but they'll ripen to a red. And these racemes are um, kind of conical in shape. 
All right, just a couple more plants for this site, and then we'll head to Tenant Lake. Here's a plant called Fool's Huckleberry or False Azalea um, Rhododendron Menzesii. It used to be called uh, Menzesii or yeah, Menzesii ferrugina, um, but it's now in the Rhododendron genus and the Heath family, the Ericaceae. Anyway, uh, one reason it was called Fool's Huckleberry is that the flowers look a little bit like a huckleberry flower. Have, they have these urn-shaped um, flowers. Um, and the bees specialize in pollinating these. They, um, they land on the bottom of the flower and they flex their wing muscles and vibrate the flower. And the pollen will fall onto the bees. Um, but uh, false azalea is um, one that shows up in swamps and also in bogs along the margins of bogs especially. Um, and let's see, other features are these, um, these elliptical leaves that look like they kind of grow in uh, whorls. And instead of having a berry like a real huckleberry, um, the plants produce capsules, dry capsules. So um, rhododendrons, all produce capsules. And um, this is on its way to becoming a capsule. So there's the flower with the um, emerging fruit, the dry fruit, which will split in um, at the top and the seeds will shake out of that capsule. <clears throat> all right, that's the false azalea. All right, beside me here is a, a small tree or big shrub called cascara. And um, usually they only get to be about 30 feet tall. And um, I guess they usually have a single um, trunk, which makes them more tree-like, but they're not as tall as um, some other trees. Anyway, uh, cascara has these leaves that uh, have smooth margins and um, are fairly elliptical. They don't have they generally don't have really pointy tips, although that one's a little bit pointy. Sometimes they're even flat on the tip of the leaf. One of the best leaf features for cascara is turning it over and looking at the veins. They're really prominent veins on the underside. Uh, they look a little bit like dogwood, but you could see that they just kind of um, angle to the side. They don't arch all the way towards the tip. And then another feature, especially um, in the summer and fall, is if you look at the buds, these are next year's leaves. Usually on almost all other plants, the buds are enclosed um, underneath a, a scale or multiple scales. Um, and the future leaves are, uh, or the future leaves rather, are enclosed underneath those um, scales. But this one doesn't have any scales on top. You could just see the embryonic leaves. Um, if you look really carefully, you could see the veins um, all folded up and tight right on the, on the tip. So people call this a naked bud, a, a bud without any protective scales. So um, when we go to Tenant Lake, we're gonna be looking and actually keying out um, some willows so I've covered a lot of what I would consider to be fairly easy trees and shrubs. If you've taken another class, maybe you've, maybe you've um, seen some of them already. Um, but we're going to go to Tenant Lake and key out some willows, which are a more difficult group. We'll uh, cover four different species. And um, the buds of willows are um, different in that they have scales, but they just have two scales, one on top and one on bottom. Um, and so that's like the next step that's more complex than having no scales on the bud. And, um, and some other plants have, you know, probably 20 or 30 scales that are all kind of shingled together to protect that embryonic leaf. So the scientific name for the cascara is, um, it's now Frangula persiana. Uh, some of the older books will probably call it Ramnus persiana. Um, and again, the common name is cascara. And this plant is used um, 
traditionally in this area as a laxative, and that um, tradition is um, not just from this area, but there are other closely related species um, that also have laxative properties. And um, so it's been actually used as a laxative uh, from all over the world. And, and today, a lot of uh, commercial laxatives are produced from this bark. It used to be that the bark was uh, wild harvested and uh, like in the 20s and 30s and 40s, a lot of uh, people and, and also a lot of Native Americans went out into the woods and collected cascara bark and sold it to pharmacies. And the pharmacies produced their own laxative from the, um, from the distillates of the bark. But um, now I think the cascara trees are grown on plantations and that's all done industrially. Okay, so uh, we have explored this swamp, call it a spruce or cedar swamp, um, dominated by you know, spruce and cedar trees in the overstory and the understory uh, by plants that really like it wet, like skunk cabbage, lady fern, and um, the uh, water um, parsley. Um, so next we're gonna go to, you know, and there are quite a bit of shrubs here too, but next we're gonna go to Tenant Lake and explore um, another woody plant wetland <laughs> called the scrub shrub wetland that doesn't have this overstory of um, tall trees, but is really thickly dominated by shrubby plants. And uh, we may see a few of the same plants like that we'll probably see redders or dogwood there, um, but we'll also see um, some new species that really thrive in these scrub shrub wetlands. I hope you enjoyed the instantaneous van ride to Tenant Lake Park. That's where we are now. Um, and uh, this is a great spot to look at um, both marshes will come here later and also um, scrub shrub and kind of old wet field wetlands. Um, <clears throat> Anyway, uh, I'm going to cover a few shrubs first. Uh, this here is black hawthorn, and <clears throat> black hawthorn gets to be maybe uh, at most 25 feet tall. Usually I see it around like 10 or 15 feet tall. And <clears throat> it is called hawthorn because it is, well, I think it's called hawthorn at least because of the thorns. <clears throat> Very stout, sharp pointed thorns. And these are among the worst thorns to get poked by because the little tip seems to break off in your skin. And every time I get poked or actually even just scratched by black hawthorn, it tends to get really inflamed and sometimes infected. There might be some compounds in there also that are uh, that cause that inflammation. Um, black hawthorn leaves, this is a, a young leaf um, or a, a leaf from a young twig Usually leaves on young twigs are a little bigger than on um, second and older year twigs. Anyway, um, same plant here. Um, some characteristics are that the uh, margin is serrated, but the margin does not have any lobes. So a lobed leaf would be like an oak or a maple, big indentations into the leaf. Some hawthorns actually have those lobes, um, particularly one that grows in the lowlands here um, called uh, Crataegus monogyna, or one-seeded hawthorn, um, <clears throat> deeply lobed. But our native black hawthorn, Crataegus, uh, well, actually there are two that we call black hawthorn, Crataegus de Glossii and um, Crataegus suxtorfii. Um, and the difference is just the number of stamens. One has 10 stamens and one has 20 stamens. Fortunately, a lot of people just lump them as one species. So we'll just call this the, the um, de Glossii, Crataegus de Glossii. Um, anyway, the margins are not lobed on this. And um, it has fruit that uh, will ripen to a black um, color with some hints of purple. Um, when it's fully ripe, it's mostly black. You can see that right now it's kind of a apple, green and red. Um, it's actually in the rose family so closely related to an apple. And um, like apples, the sepals uh, wither and are persistent, wither but don't fall off. They're persistent on the tip of the fruit. And if we break one of these open, ow, stab myself. Um, 
we could see that um, it has several um, seeds inside as opposed to the another a difference between that and the um, Corcus or Crataegus monogyna, which just has one seed, mono meaning one and gyna meaning um, seed essentially. Doesn't technically mean seed, but it's like the female um, structure of the flower that ends up being the seed. Uh, okay, I think those are the main features for the um, Crataegus deglossii. And um, the wood is really tough. So if you ever needed to make a makeshift tool handle, uh, this would be a good choice for making a tool handle because the, the wood is really strong. Uh, you know, I mentioned that it's related to an apple and some people actually graft their apple scion onto rootstock from hawthorn and it'll take, you could, you could graft um, apples and pears onto hawthorn. And what's the benefit to that? Well, if you live in a really wet place, it's hard to get rootstock that thrives in a wet environment. And uh, black hawthorn likes growing in um, wet areas, not saturated all year round, but uh, seasonally wet soils. And um, so that could be a good uh, use of a native species to cross it with a, or graft it onto a introduced fruit bearing species. You can eat the black hawthorn fruit, but they're pretty mealy and um, not sweet. So here is a twig from the Crataegus monogyna, the one seeded hawthorn and we could see how the leaves are deeply lobed as opposed to the um, unlobed leaves of the Crataegus deglossii, the black hawthorn. One of the things I like about uh, Tennant Lake here is that it has a boardwalk and you could just walk right through a swamp, which is usually really hard to do because they're so wet. Um, but it's a good place to see a swamp. You can see there's standing water and trees and shrubs um, some areas of the boardwalk actually shoot out into um, an area that doesn't have any big trees. It's all sh shrubs, so that's the scrub shrub wetland part. Um, but there aren't very many places around where you could walk through um, a swamp or a scrub shrub wetland with any sort of ease. Uh, one time I was doing this and I actually stepped off the boardwalk and fell into the water, so I'm going to try and pay a little more attention. Um, you know, uh, the best way to study for this class is actually to visit some of the sites that I take you on these virtual field trips. And if you live in Bellingham or Ferndale, this is gonna be an easy one to come to. Um, it's open, so uh, come on over um, if you get the chance and you could look at the same plants that I'm looking at. Okay, a few herbaceous plants that I want you to learn. You know, the focus has been on trees and sh shrubs, but um, this, is a, this is a good one. Um, this is called jewelweed, impatience capensis is the scientific name. And I don't think it's doing it yet, but um, it has um, these seed clusters that if you just touch them when they're fully ripe, they explode and they shoot the seeds a pretty long distance. So that's the seed dispersal mechanism. Unlike some of the trees, which use the wind to disperse the seeds, um, this one has an explosive, uh, a dehiscent it's called. Um, well, that means splitting, I think. But anyway, uh, seed structure. So um, let's see, this is not a shrub, it's an herb. So it has a, um, an annual shoot that comes up every year and um, serrated leaf margins. It has yellow flowers that are gone right now and those um, exploding seed heads. Here is black twinberry, Lanicera involucrata. Now, um, all the, this is in the honeysuckle family, the Caprifoliaceae. And the honeysuckle family always has opposite leaves. So you can see this leaf is directly opposite that one. Um, and here is, um, I had to pick this from a dark area. It's hard to film in this dappled light. But this is one that has flowers and fruit on it. And we can see that the fruit are surrounded by this bract that is really reddish. And right now the fruit is green, but it'll turn black. That's why it's called black twinberry, because inside each of these, or right there, there's actually two fruit. And here is another two fruit. So everything about this plant is in pairs. 
even, the leaves are in pairs. There are two uh, flower stems, and each of those flowering stems has two flowers and two fruits. The, the flowers are yellow. It's obviously done flowering now, um, and the fruit will ripen to a very black, um, shiny black uh, berry. And um, traditionally, the berry actually is used as a paint, so you could um, squeeze it and um, stain things with it. So fairly broad, or not broad, fairly long, pointy um, leaves and um, a wimpy but slightly woody uh, stem are good features for the black twinberry, Lenicera involucrata. Here is a classic scrub shrub wetland plant. Uh, this is called Mirica gale, or sweet gale is the common name. I think it's one of the easiest scientific names to remember because neither word sounds all that uh, difficult. Mirica, M-Y-R, um, I-C-A, Mirica, and gale, G-A-L-E. Um, and this is a very fragrant shrub. Again, what is it about wetland plants and fragrance? Um, if you crush these, um, these seeds and smell them, they just smell divine. Uh, you could get some of that smell from the leaves too, but those little uh, clusters of, they're almost like cones, but they're clusters of seeds that um, are the most fragrant part. Um, some other features, well, it has a long uh, leaf with a slightly serrated margin. Um, it flowers pretty early in the spring. Uh, it has these uh, little dainty flowers right along the top of the stem um, that I believe are pink. And um, the stem itself is um, covered with lenticels um, and kind of a purple-black color. And uh, usually you see this growing right out of water. I'd say it's one of our most um, uh, adapted species to saturated soil conditions. It can, seems to grow fine in permanently saturated soils. Um, we would otherwise call this a marsh, except that it has woody plants in it, and so we call it a scrub shrub wetland. Um, and, you know, it's able to get taller than a lot of other woody plants and keep out the herbaceous um, marsh plants for the most part. Uh, so this is Mirica Gale. Let me show one other over here. We have, um, this is also Mirica Gale, and here we see these, um, these buds, um, same plant, just uh, um, different structure. So there are males and females. So this is the male here. The male flowers were um, coming out of those little uh, bud things. And this is the female plant here. And the female flowers turn into um, the seeds. So we call that dioecious, which means that the male and female plants are, or flowers are in different plants. So um, this here is the male plant, and over here we have the female plant. Okay, another a scrub shrub wetland plant uh, often grows with Mirica, but this um, plant actually has a broader um, at least it's found, I find it much more commonly than Mirica, um, so it probably has a broader habitat tolerance. Um, this is called Douglas Spirea, or hardhack, sometimes people say. I think that name probably comes from surveyors that were trying to walk along um, section boundaries in perfectly straight lines and had to go through wetlands filled with this, which must just be a nightmare. I mean, I can't imagine doing it. Okay, so um, not only is it found in similar places, but I think it looks, the leaves look kind of similar to the uh, Mirica. Here, I'll pull up a, here's the Mirica leaf with um, kind of serrations towards the tip and long leaf, longer than wide. And we can see that the hardhack leaf is similar, it's just way bigger. Um, and if you look really carefully, the hardhack doesn't have sort of a resin dotted um, leaf surface like the uh, Mirica does. It's those resin glands that um, release that aromatic compound. But anyway, I'm supposed to be done talking about Mirica. So uh, Douglas Spirea um, has a pyramid-shaped inflorescence. Again, an inflorescence is the cluster of flowers. Um, 
and this time of the year they're just starting to bloom. Uh, we could see here's one that hasn't yet blo started blooming yet. Um, this is last year's inflorescence. They persist for a really long time. When I was here in the spring, they still had uh, dried flowers on it, but now most of the dried flowers have fallen off. Um, I, that's probably about all I want to say about uh, Douglas Spirea or Spirea de Glossii. Now, um, David Douglas uh, wasn't a, he didn't name all these plants after himself, um, but de Glossii is a very common um, species epithet or the, the second part of the scientific name is called the species epithet. Um, the first part is the genus. Anyway, um, he was one of the first botanists in the area. Um, only uh, Lewis and Clark did some botanical collection, of course, down at the mouth of the Columbia. And um, Archibald Menzies did some botanical collection in the Puget Sound in 1792. Lewis and Clark were here in 1804, 1805, or maybe 1805, 1806. Um, David Douglas was exploring Washington and Oregon and parts of Idaho, um, largely by foot, um, in 18, uh, I think between about 1820 and maybe into the 1830s. Um, and he was mainly interested in uh, things with pretty flowers and he was shipping seeds back to the Royal Horticultural Society in England and they would plant those seeds and grow the plants and sell them to uh, landscape or rich uh, people with estates that needed all the new and latest cultivated varieties or just exotic species. So uh, anyway, David Douglas must have also been attracted to these um, beautiful flowers, collected seeds, and he also collected a lot of voucher specimens and later botanists realized that these were new species and um, named many of them in his honor. Okay, so this here is uh, the bark of a plant called nine bark. I think it's called that because some people think that there are nine layers of bark. Anyway, there's obviously many layers. This is uh, Physocarpus capitata, Pacific nine bark. So the bark is a good feature, but let's take a look at some of the other features. Up a little higher at the top of the plant, um, we can see that it has these uh, head-like clusters of flowers. Now cap, cap, like a ball cap. Well, cap actually means head. They're fruiting now. When they're flowering, they're white and they're really, um, they look like popcorn balls that somebody glued to the top of a tree. Before I, when I was like eight years old, I called this the popcorn tree. It's actually a shrub. Um, so anyway, these uh, round clusters of uh, seeds and flowers are good, a good feature. The leaves are kind of maple shaped and they're hairless or the term um, glabrous is what you might see in your book, which means smooth or hairless. There are a lot of different words for hairy structures. So some of the, like the hooker's willow, uh, you might describe the underside of the leaf as lanate, which is like a thick woolly hair layer um, or ciliate, which is kind of sparsely haired um, long, especially long hairs. Um, I'm sure we'll come across many other hair terms. Pubescent, which um, just means hairy. <laughs> All right, so Pacific nine bark is not hairy. I don't know, I'm rambling on about hairiness right now. Oh, because it's glabrous, that's why. Hairless. Um, and uh, likes, you know, swampy uh, areas. I see it under trees quite often, like uh, at the Hertz Trail at the south end of Lake Wacom. When you're walking through the swampy areas there, there's tons of nine bark. But I can't go everywhere for this course, so I'll just limit myself to two spots. Okay, we've covered a lot of uh, species so far. Most of them are uh, pretty common, and uh, many of them are quite recognizable things that you might actually already know. But um, I want to add a little bit of challenge. Uh, so. Um, I'm going to talk about a few grass-like plants and some willows uh, to round out this week's unit. Um, 
And we're actually, in future units, going to dive more into the grasses, sedges, and rushes, all plants that are commonly called graminoids, which is a life form that includes three different families, at least, plant families. Um, and, but I just want to give you a, a quick overview of the three, how to, how to distinguish the grasses, the sedges, and the rushes, and then teach you the first sedge that we'll learn. Um, so here is just this kind of, uh, you know, swampy ground with a shrub here and some old field next to it. And uh, this is a, I got all three species growing here, or three um, families. Um, so we'll start with this one. Um, this is a rush, and there's a mnemonic. People say sedges have edges, uh, rushes are round, and grasses have joints um, all the way to the ground. And so let me explain that mnemonic a bit. So uh, this is a rush, and it's round. I can roll it easily in my finger. The stem or culm, it's called for graminoids, is the um, supportive uh, the structure that supports the flower on a graminoid. Um, and rushes have a round culm, okay? And it tends to lack uh, joints. Um, okay, so uh, rushes are round. How about uh, sedges? So the mnemonic says sedges have edges. And sometimes you have to be careful with the edginess of the sedges because um, they can be really sharp and cut you. In fact, I recently was cut bad enough to need stitches by a sedge, so I'm going to use my knife to cut the sedge and show you. Okay, so this is um, a sedge, and I've cut it down near the base. All of this actually is attached at the root. Um, so these are the leaves, and this is the flowering stem, which is called a, a culm. All right. So with sedges, the culm actually is the thing that has edges. Um, so in some cases, that edge is sharp to the touch. Um, on this particular one, on this particular one, it's the leaves that actually could do the cutting. Um, but the this culm in cross section is angled, it, it's triangular in cross section, and that, that is the edginess of a sedge. Okay, so all the members of the Carex genus, which this is part of, um, have um, culms that are roughly triangular. They're never square or round, but sometimes the um, edges of the triangle are a little bit rounded. So there's another look at the Colm cross section. Okay, and um, some more just uh, quick things about sedge anatomy, because this is actually one that um, I want you to learn for this week. Uh, this is called slew sedge or Carex obnupta. Um, so sedges have um, flowers in uh, clusters, their uh, cluster of flowers is called an inflorescence. And furthermore, with sedges, we use some specialized terminology and we call that cluster of flower um, a spikelet. So sometimes the spikelets are dangly like this, which is actually a good feature for identifying this Carex obnupta or slew sedge. Um, dangling spikelets and we have um, male spikelets on the top and female spikelets uh, down below. So it has both sexes on one plant, which means that it is um, monoecious. Um, both sexes in one house, monoecious literally means one house. Um, but the all the female flowers and now seeds are on one spikelet, there are the seeds, and I'll, I'll tell you what those are called in a later unit. They have a specialized term. Um, and all the male flowers that release pollen are on um, these three other spikelets. 
Okay, so th that's just a taste. Uh, there's definitely a lot more to um, sedge anatomy and identification, but this is one of our most distinct, uh, I think, sedges, and it's very common in swamps, and so that's why I want to teach it to you now. I'm gonna take a break and let this helicopter pass. All right, the border patrol decided that I wasn't a serious threat and they moved on. I, maybe they were worried about the type of grass I was teaching you. Uh, so next we get to grasses, and um, this is a common weedy species uh, called reed canary grass. It's not on the study list for this week, but um, a good chance if you go out into your backyard and you find a tall grass, and maybe not your backyard, but a old field, it could be reed canary grass. So the mnemonic sedges have edges, we saw rushes are round, we saw, and grasses have joints. Um, and so this is a joint, okay? So the comb is here, and along the comb, we see these joints, okay? Bamboo also has joints. They're just nodes, um, so growth kind of happens. Um, uh, never mind, scratch that. I don't know how that relates to growth, but somehow nodes relate to growth. <laughs> Um, so the, this is a good feature of all the grasses is that they, ha they have these um, nodes or joints. So that's how you tell a grass, a sedge, and um, a rush apart. And so I'm just going to get a shot of all the distinctive features in one. The sedge is triangular, it has edges, the rush is round, and the grass has those nodes. Now grasses are also round, so to distinguish a grass from a um, rush, you need to look for those nodes. Okay, I'm going to teach you four different willow species um, today. And these are the four most common species in the lowlands of western Washington. Um, and I think the easiest one to learn is this one here called Salix lassiandra, or Pacific willow. And it has several features that are just much different than the rest of them. Okay, so one good feature is these long acuminate tips. See how long pointed the tips are? Another very distinctive feature is that the margins are serrated. A lot of the other willows have smooth margins. And then um, another good feature is the yellowness of the twig. Okay, so some other general willow characteristics. All willows have alternate leaves. Many willows have these things called stipules, which are leaf-like structures uh, where the petiole meets the, um, the twig, or the stem. So I talked about, um, I mentioned stipules when we were looking at the stink current, because it has hairs instead of a stipule. Um, and then hairiness is a good thing to pay attention to. Um, the Pacific willow, the Salix lucida, is not hairy. No hairs on the upper surface of the leaf. It's kind of whitish, but doesn't have any hairs on the lower surface of the leaf. Now, um, willows are in their own family, the Salicaceae, the willow family. And it is another family that has catkins. And willows are Another word we just learned, they're dioecious. So they have um, male plants and female plants. The, the male flowers are in one plant and the female flowers are in another plant. And it has um, a different type of catkin for each one. So the female catkins release seeds that are usually very fluffy and um, similar to cottonwood seeds, which is a member of the um, willow family, the Salicaceae. Um, and the male catkins, they just, once they release their pollen, they basically wither and die. Um, now, willows tend to do their catkin production pretty early in the spring. Um, and the Salix lassiandra, uh, it has a yellow um, female catkin. Or sorry, it's, it's the male catkin. The anthers are very yellow on it. Um, and uh, that's a distinctive feature. Again, that yellowness, which um, is part of 
one of the scientific names, the synonym. Uh, so I think that's all I want to say about um, this one. A lot of willows are very flexible. They grow really fast. Um, you know, they have medicinal value. Those uh, aspirin is a derivative of the willow bark. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it there. Uh, found a willow, a Pacific willow here that um, is still has some um, catkins on it. So these are the female catkins, which are always going to be a little, uh, persist a little bit longer. We can see how some of the fluff is starting to burst out of the little um, capsules. So long pointed serrated leaves of the Pacific willow with the female catkins. Okay, a different willow here. Uh, this is Sitco willow. Salix sitchensis, and there's one like guarantee feature for Sitka willow and a bunch of minor features, um, but let's uh, let's compare it. Actually, right next to it here, we have the um, Pacific willow leaf, and we can see that the Sitka willow leaves are often much smaller, and um, that tip might be a little bit pointy, but it doesn't have that long accumulate tip. It's more of an abrupt. Um, tip. And the margins are smooth, they're not serrated. Okay, so those are good ways to, to tell it apart from the Sitka willow, but um, the fail-safe feature for the, I'm going to tell it apart from the Pacific willow, the fail-safe feature for the um, Sitka willow, Salix sitchensis, is looking at the underside of the leaf, which is covered with fine hairs. Okay. And there's a special thing about these hairs. You ever use one of those uh, little uh, cards as a kid where there's actually two images and you um, change the position slightly and it'll alternate from one to the other image? Well, the underside of the Sitka willow leaf kind of does that. The hairs reflect light in a way that um, it appears white from one angle and then when you turn it to another angle, it suddenly t changes to like a green color. Okay, so Sitka willow, um, it actually generally doesn't get quite as tall as the Pacific willow. The Pacific willow gets to be a tree in size. Uh, the, the Sitka willow tends to be um, under 20 feet tall. Um, it still has stipules at the base of the leaves. Um, and the twig isn't usually um, a yellowish color. You can see this is kind of a, um, what is that, an orangish coppery color on the first year twigs, and the second year twigs are usually kind of more of a tan. Okay. So I think that's the second easiest willow to identify just by that two tone quality of the leaves. But other willows still have hairy leaves on the bottom. We're going to see one of those next. Okay, a third willow species here, also growing in fairly saturated soils. Um, this is the hooker's willow, Salix hookeri hookeri <laughs> hookeriana, or hookeriana, that's it. Um, anyway, this willow, um, from a distance, you could tell that the leaves are wider than any of the ones we've learned so far. Um, the underside of the leaves are covered with a dense hair. And I use the underside of these leaves as a, a good, reliable identification characteristic. But don't be fooled um, with the uh, Sitka Salix sitchensis, which is here on the right. These hairs are really, really fine and have that two-tone quality, whereas the hairs on the hooker's willow are more of a matte finish. Um, they're longer and thicker, um, and they have a little bit of a rusty brown um, hue to them. And turn the leaf over, and let me find one that has more of it. Uh, some of the young leaves, especially the young leaves, they'll be, have a fine coat of these rusty brown hairs in the spring and early summer. Later in the summer, that'll wear off. Um, so 
broader leaves, um, fairly big leaves overall, felted hairs on the underside, and growing close to the ocean are all good characters of the, um, of the hooker's willow. Okay, only one more to go. We're covering the lowland willows. Let's look for the schooler's willow is the last one I'm gonna teach you. So uh, this is a really good spot in the, on the boardwalk trail where we can see the scrub shrub wetland, you know, really thick um, Mirica Gale and Douglas Spirea on either side of the trail. Uh, those seem to be the dominance with a few um, Pacific and there's some frogs, <laughs> a few um, Pacific willows and a few uh, Sitka willows. The biggest uh, deciduous tree around here is the black cottonwood. And black cottonwood can tolerate pretty uh, wet conditions and is often found along um, rivers. It thrives from the disturbance of rivers that shift channels all the time. And the seeds, of course, they can disperse really far. And when they land on bare uh, mineral soil, they tend to germinate pretty well. Um, above me here is a very large black cottonwood. This is Poplis trichocarpa. Again, a member of the willow family, the Salicaceae. And um, the top of the, it's hard to see the leaf features from here, but the top surface of the leaves are really glossy um, and the under surface is kind of white. It has uh, thickly furrowed bark. Uh, you know, sometimes it looks a little bit like Douglas fir bark, um, kind of a gray, deeply fissured bark. And um, from a distance, you really can uh, get a better appreciation for its height and for the thickness of the side limbs, giant, side limbs that stick out um, another good feature and you know a week ago there was still cottonwood fluff drifting everywhere which to me is kind of a harbinger of summer um, usually just as it starts to get warm is when they start to fluff and um, usually around the time when the first salmon berries are ripe okay this shrub here uh, has opposite leaves and um, it used to be placed in the honeysuckle family, but now it's actually a different family, the uh, Adoxaceae. Um, anyway, uh, the, this is called um, highbush cranberry or native viburnum eduli. And uh, I hope to point out um, an introduced species as well that's sometimes confused with this, but um, some good features. Uh, the leaves have been all chewed on by insects, but um, we could see that there are three points on the leaf, but all the points are just up right at, kind of almost at the very tip, 90% um, into the um, plant. If you can't tell, I'm at home now. <laughs> uh, but this is a plant that'll grow in um, riversides and um, swamps, um, especially at higher elevation. Um, and it has a red berry and um, white flowers that are in a, um, a kind of a flat topped cluster. Uh, so really good native species and a shrub. And so I threw it in this unit because, um, well, it grows in swamps, but you probably won't see it in our lowland swamps. You have to get up uh, to about 1,000 to 3,000 feet in elevation before it'll show up, and especially in areas along rivers. Viburnum aduli, aduli meaning edible. So this species is quite tasty. It tastes a lot like cranberry. It's tart um, and the fruit are uh, red like cranberries, but they often have some speckling a little bit like um, an apple or something like that. Uh, how sometimes apples are both red and green. All right, I showed you our native uh, Viburnum eduli or native highbush cranberry. And I wanna compare it to this um, Viburnum opulus variety opulus, the European highbush cranberry. I think this was planted here by accident and that's part of the reason that I want to point it out to you is because um, some nurseries are selling this plant as a native because they actually think it's viburnum eduli. So I'm going to give you a trick for how to distinguish the two. Um, so one of the best features, let's see, is where the um, the leaves Remember I taught you about stipules. The leaves of the uh, viburnum opulus 
have stipules, whereas the, the petiole, the base of the leaf where it attaches to the twig, on the viburnum edulee does not have stipules. All right, another uh, good comparison is that right at the base of the leaf blade, at the top of the petiole, are these glands. The leaves of Viburnum opulus have glands, whereas the leaves of our native Viburnum edulee do not have glands. Okay, another feature is the flowers. Stepped on my mic cord. Okay, the flowers, um, when they're blooming, uh, they will have these bigger uh, white, what are called filleries. They're non-reproductive flowers. They're just kind of advertising for the whole cluster. Um, anyway, the fillery uh, petals are a lot bigger than the reproductive flowers in the center on the viburnum opulus. But on the viburnum eduli, all the flowers are the same size. There are no filleries. And then another feature is that we could see here that the flower is born on a twig that has two pairs of leaves. Whereas the native viburnum opulus, the flowers are born on twigs that just have one pair of leaves. So there are many features to distinguish this from the native viburnum eduli, but for some reason I see this planted in landscaping. Native plant landscapes, like all the other plants in this landscaping are native plants, but uh, this one they just screwed up. So I'm on a mission to fix it. Um, we see this uh, more in lowlands because it's an introduced species, usually near humans. The viburnum eduli, it is a marsh or a swamp plant, but um, I usually only see it above a thousand feet in elevation and maybe below 3,000 or 3,500 feet in elevation. We don't tend to see it in Western Washington down near the coast in our um, lowlands swamps. As you move north in, into British Columbia, though, you will see it um, in the scrub, shrub zone of like estuary salt, or, you know, the fresh zone of, a, of an estuary of the marsh. Um, but that doesn't happen here, at least that I've seen so far. One species of rose that'll grow in wetter environments is uh, Rosa pisocarpa, um, or I think the common name is clustered rose. And here's one that's still flowering. The, the petals are a little smaller than that of uh, Nootka Rose, if you know that, down here. And um, the fruit, which are starting to form, grow in clusters. Here's uh, three all together. Um, over here we have yeah, three all together. Here's four all together. <clears throat> Whereas the Nootka Rose, Usually you just have one or maybe two that are together. Um, it has prickles, uh, mainly concentrated at the base of the leaves, which is similar to Nuka Rose. Um, and it has um, sepals that are persistent on the, on the hip, which is also kind of similar to Nuka Rose. So these are sepals. The petals actually fall off once they're done but the sepals persist. Rosa pisacarpa. Okay, the last of the willows I want to show you is um, Schooler's willow, or Salix schoolariana. And this willow tends to have a little bit smaller leaves and they're broad. And if you were to cut um, the leaf in half, the broadest point of the leaf would be towards the tip of that halfway point, generally. Um, and the underside of the leaves are um, sometimes a little bit hairy, and um, as they age, they tend to lose some of their hairs, and they can be totally smooth on the underside. So compared with the hookers, which is uh, very hairy on the underside, this is just moderately hairy, enough that you could clearly see the, um, hairless enough that you could clearly see the veins. Um, what else? The stipules. Um, this uh, schooler's willow will have stipules. We could see that there are still some on that twig, but they actually tend to fall off on this species a little bit um, in the late spring and early summer. 
um, so it has deciduous stipules. So um, another good feature, um, again, it likes growing in more of an upland habitat. So if you see a willow and you're not really in a wetland, the first thing you su suspect would be the, the schooler's willow. Sitka willow will also sometimes grow in uplands, um, but the underside of the leaf is very different from the Sitka. It doesn't have that two-tone nature. Um, so that's, uh, that's it for the willows. And actually, I think I'll make that the last species for this video. Um, really I encourage you to be studying these uh, outside. And that's part of the reason that I assigned the digital species collection is to get you outside practicing these um, identifications and then um, you know, photographing and uploading your observations onto iNaturalist. Um, I ended up having to drive around a bit to find a schooler's willow, so I don't think there's actually one at Tennant Lake. Um, so if you go there looking for all four species, you might be disappointed, but there are three there, which is pretty good. Um, uh, I guess that's it. Thanks for joining me, and I'll catch you next time. For this week's lab, we're going to just focus on those four willows and um, review the features. I have them all in front of me now um, so we could compare uh, one to the next. And um, it's not going to be very involved, so I'm going to do this a little bit like a quiz show too. So I'll, I'll give you a chance to guess before I tell you what it is. Um, so starting with this one, what are some features that you notice about the leaf? upper surface, the lower surface, the margin, and the tip. Well, hopefully you've noticed that um, the tip is pointy, the margins are serrated, the um, leaf does not have hairs on the upper or lower surface. Um, the stipules are pretty prominent. Oh, here's a feature that I didn't mention in the field. Um, this is a bud. Now, it, it'll get a little bit bigger than this as it uh, develops throughout the summer, but the buds of this species look a little bit like a duckbill. So they have a ridge that runs down the center that's like the top of the duckbill, and then it flares out on either side, um, and it's kind of uh, a little bit blunt on the tip, not super blunt, but a little bit blunt. So uh, I mentioned in the field that the willow buds are just two scales that um, press together. And on this one, the bottom scale is flat and the top scale is a little bit um, puckered up like this, which gives it that duckbill look. Okay, so this, um, this one here is the Pacific Willow um, Salix Lassiandra. All right. Oh yeah, and it has that yellowish twig. Pacific Willow. Now, you may have noticed this uh, structure here. That's a, a gall, so there's an insect living in there. There's also a gall on the leaf. Um, the larval stage of some type of galling insect bur has burrowed into the leaf and um, trick the, released a hormone that has tricked the plant into growing this gall structure around the insect larva. And it actually feeds on the inside of that structure. Okay, so next let's look at this one here. Um, so we could see that the upper surface of the leaf is fairly hairless. Um, the twig is a very different color. Uh, it actually has a gall in it too. Um, the leaves are not long acuminate at the tip, but they do have a little bit of a point. Um, then we get to that underside of the leaf. It's got that two-tone quality to it. Um, that's a little, what is it? <laughs> this is the um, Salix sitchensis, the Sitka willow. So the dead giveaway for me is the underside of the leaf. 
and this will grow in wetlands but also in upland sites. Okay, now we have, uh, these are actually both the same plant. Uh, this is just new growth, first year twig, and this is older growth. Um, and so what do we got? We have um, leaves that have some hairs on the bottom. Uh, the top, maybe we'll have some hairs in the spring, but right now it's hairless. Uh, it's pretty shiny uh, and dark green on the top and just a dull green on the bottom. I guess that's true for all of them. Um, if we cut this leaf in half, the broadest point is actually above the half line. True for this leaf too. Broadest point is towards the tip. Um, and how about this first year growth? Is that still true? Uh, broadest point. It's kind of close to the middle there. Um, broadest point is above the middle. Um, so this, this one, the habitat is really key. So it's growing usually in uplands more than in wetlands. Um, and this is the schooler's willow, Salix schooleriana. Okay. Um, and the buds here, um, they're just rounded on one side and flat on the other. They don't have that ridge in the middle. Um, so that makes it uh, different from the Pacific Willow. Okay, and the last one here, it has um, shiny green leaves that uh, on the upper surface that can sometimes have um, hair, faint hair on the upper surface. And the undersurface is very densely hairy, so much so that it almost obscures the uh, veins on the undersurface of the leaf. Um, the young twigs are actually uh, densely haired as well. Um, gray haired, according to the book. And um, let's see, if we slice one of these leaves in half or find the midpoint, um, it's broadest at right about the midpoint. There's another one, broadest right about the midpoint. So that seems to be true for um, most of these. But to be honest, I think looking at features, um, the features of the schooler's willow is most similar to this one, um, but the habitat is very different. This one is always coastal and almost always uh, in wetlands. Okay, so what's this one? This is the hooker's willow or Salix hookeriana. Okay, so that concludes uh, the short lab um, no, no microscope work uh, for this one. We'll just take some close-up photos of the different features for you to look at. And oh, I, I'm actually splicing those into the video, so what I'm saying now is probably useless. But thanks all, and I'll see you next time.